Hello, everyone. I think we're live now. Uh, welcome, one and all. Um, thank you for joining us today um, and being a part of Osprey Games' content for our shucks at 2021. Uh, today, we've gathered two fantastic designers, David Turksey and David Digby, both of whom I've had the pleasure of working with before, to discuss solo modes generally and the work they've done for Osprey Games specifically. Uh, so my name's David Digby. I'm a board game designer and developer based in the UK. Um, got about half a dozen solo modes that are now published or have hit Kickstarter. Um, started with Chocolate Factory for Alley Cat Games. Um, I've done the Undaunted series. I've done Eternal Palace, Tinner's Trail, Dice Theme Park, uh, and been involved as a developer on some other projects as well. Maharaja, some things for the other David. Um, Merv for Osprey, I did a little bit of work on as well. Hi, I'm David. I'm a Hungarian game designer currently based in the Netherlands, uh, but I was in the UK for a while uh, before. And uh, most people have heard of me as the either the designer of Anachrony or as the guy with all the solo modes, which I think I counted two days ago as there's 38 solo modes that the public knows about that I have worked on. Most of it just tends to be uh, giving good ideas to smart people like Mr. Digby here and then let them do all the work. That's, but I'm here because I worked with Osprey in two projects recently. The aforementioned undaunted solo mode uh, with, for Dave Thompson and Trevor Benjamin with David Digby and Imperium Legends and down here Classics, which is coming like very, very soon. It's co-designed with Nigel Buckle. Um, what is the uh, single most important uh, bit of advice you have for someone who's trying to design a solo mode? I think it's get a new job. Yeah, <laughs> I think for me it's finding the right solo mode for the get for the game. Um, I I don't kind of toe the normal line of just the option. Your options are an autumn or a beat your own score. I think there's a lot more grey areas um, involved in solo design, and I think finding what your key experience is and what you want the solo game to be like and how you want your solo gamers to experience that game and then coming up with the best design from that that standpoint. And that's not always building an automa. It might be creating a series of challenges. It might be turning it into a into a variable puzzle. Um, I think there's a lot of options within the within the design space, but identifying that I think is probably the, the core of where you would start. Yeah, there's no point in making a, a a massive, very complex, very detailed flowchart type solo mode for what is a light filler game. Uh, it's yeah. finding the, the appropriate design space to use. For me, it's yes, obviously, try to match the style of the game to the audience and 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 uh, what sort of solo mode you're looking for. But to me, the most important bit is because I want to, I, I I try to work on solo modes for games that I think are good. And why do I think they are good? Why do other people think they are good? What's good about the game? And especially with more interactive, more strategic, more meaningfully nuanced games, those things start to get lost as you abstract it out in solo. So for me, the most important thing about, this, uh, about the quality of the solo mode is how little of its multiplayer goodness have you lost. Are there any games out there you think it's impossible to make a good solo game for? I think everything's probably possible, but it's whether you bother. In, and in, in the kindest sense, do you pour hundreds of hours of development into producing a solo mode just to say that you've got a solo mode and it's still not very good? Or do you cut it off very quickly and say, this is going to be a lot of work and it's still not going to be brilliant and just don't bother? Um, so I think it's probably possible, but whether it's optimal and a good idea or not is a different question. Um, lots of spatial elements, lots of hidden information and, and where things are very subjective. So this particular area on the board is worth something to you, but it's worth something different to someone else. And, and associating that pattern of thought is a very difficult thing to automate. I mean, if you zoom out further, then yes, there are plenty of games that are impossible to make solo modes for, but those are time, the games that people don't even tend to think to make solo modes for, other than when they ask this question. Uh, and so anywhere where the actual social interaction is what makes the game fun, 
what's the point interacting with a deck of cards? So because because if the story or the narrative, then at least that can be like written. But but if it's about you know uh, uh, bluffing or or you know like um, resistance style games, like what's the point of of uh, of trying to guess what a random set of components have decided for you? Um, on if narrowed down to the games that make any sort of sense in solo, can they not be? Uh, I think we already said the best ones, anything with a high spatial prioritization tends to get insane flowcharts. Uh, and the question is, if it's, it doesn't have to be a quick flowchart, but it has to be something that the resolving human, i.e. you, can do in a heartbeat. Whereas if it's a, okay, step one, okay, step, then, then, then step back and don't bother. Um, to me, for, for the longest time, uh, hidden information was the, this can't be done. These days, I would like to, I, I tend to narrow it down to it can't be done if, if every little thing is a hidden information that could matter. Like Twilight Struggle, it's like you can make a solo mode that puts influence on the board and creates a way for you to fight against, but you will never look in the, uh, your eyes, uh, in the opponent of your eyes and say, did he figure out that I have a Europe scoring in my hand or not? Because it, it's not the fact that your cards are hidden. Many games have hidden cards that are perfectly soloable. The fact that your moves are good, depending on what you know that the opponent knows. So that doesn't work. But I have done solo modes for light block war games, where the bot didn't know what were on my units. And that worked perfectly because the interaction was not the knowledge, but the heuristic to guess how good an attack target is, is different for a hidden unit than for an open unit. Um, what is the hardest solo mode that you have taken on, you have worked on today, starting with David Turchi? Cerebria, almost definitely, because, because it's extremely interactive. It's high in complexity, but short in curve. And uh, everything matters. Yeah. And the bot needed to be unpredictable enough that you're not just running through a loop, but predictable enough that it's not just randomly dropping a stink bomb somewhere in the middle of the board so that you can actually play against it. But, but like three, four, five, six iterations in, people were playing to cheat the bot, not beat it at the game. And and to figure out how to patch all the cheats without doubling the rules of the solo mode even further was the challenge of a lifetime. Uh, I mean, I've had... Yes, I guess that's particularly a challenge for Cerebria because as we were saying, the target audience is one that if you can exploit the bot, they're going to likely find a way to do it. Uh, so yes. while you might have gotten away with some weak points in a bot in a simpler game, in a game like Cerebria, it's a real problem. Yes, exactly. And and because the whole challenge is you have three to five turns of three actions to make a series of combos that knocks the other guy over just by one bit. If there's a series of combos that will always knock the bot over, then why bother playing? So so that, that was a lot and a lot and a lot. I mean, there has been bots that caused problems or had fixes had to be applied. Uh, uh, there's a one of the board and dice heroes, Tris Magistus, newbie players score around 60 points in the game, experienced players score around 290 points. So we were like, so what are we doing with the bot then? So we aimed the bot around 90 points and then once the game came out, then within a week, the best players were doubling its score. So we released all the secret uh, difficulty tweaks that we were considering and then a week later players were still doubling the bot score so <laughs> yeah a bit of an arms race <laughs> exactly so yeah. it, it, it all depends on how well behaving a game is um tennis trial um, really yeah so, that's um, the martin that's wallace right. media weight euro game right yeah yeah we redeveloped that um last year and it, it successfully kick-started at the beginning of this year and I very quickly built a two-player variant and went, brilliant, the two-player game's really good. Everyone's enjoying it. Solo will be easy. No. no. <laughs> Did no. the auctions? What's going on with it? Uh, auctions were abstracted 
quite a lot already in the two player game so that wasn't yeah. that wasn't too bad but the just getting a, a system that was simple enough to run because there was always going to be little flow charts involved in well why are you going here what are you doing all right great you're doing this action so you're buying a mine which, which mine are you going to buy what which of these 24 hidden pieces of hidden information is considered more valuable so things like that were always going to be a flow chart and it was coming up with a, the best system that would allow you to go right that's what it's doing and i consult this and now i know what that and it and it still did roughly the right thing most of the time but it was still a little bit unpredictable it still kind of pulled moves off that weren't prescribed so that you could interact with it um but it we had to find a way of stopping it doing things that were flat out stupid um you know it just suddenly randomly went i'll oh, pass what why what why are you passing yeah it, it kind of and discovering a way to, to build that was was difficult i went through three full iterations so completely yeah. going back to the drawing board three times yeah um, i think i think we all know the shouting at your own bot stage <laughs> of solo mode design yeah. you know, sounds like you hit that phrase good and proper yeah definitely so yeah, yeah. that was a, that was a tough one um obviously you guys uh both worked on the solo mode for uh undaunted uh it's included in undaunted reinforcements but covers uh, all the content in reinforcements and all of the content in north africa and all of the content in undaunted normandy my first question is what was your favorite thing about the undaunted game multiplayer when when people say i don't play war games i always try to explain them that what they mean is they don't enjoy uh, lookup tables uh, outcome randomness for realism's sake um uh, punitive oh my units died i might as well give up the game now uh, procedural resolution here's the 20 steps check if you have enough spaghetti you know uh, th these sort of things so when 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 i try to approach more more like conflict as a subject which i've done in two or three games before then i always try to say okay here's the conflict we're modeling abstract it up and then turn it into a euro game and then the output of the euro game will be me shooting units but when i have to choose do i move left or do i move right then it shouldn't be a oh napoleon thought it was a great great idea to ride up the hill because that means nothing to me it's about if i move here this is my strategy if i move there and and i create richness of choice by adding layers which makes for very very interesting games but usually a bit more complicated than what the average not heavy euro gamer would want and because conflict gamers are often not average heavy euro gamers there is this gap that the euro players go oh this is too war the war gamers go oh, this is too euro and and deck building has been done a million times dominion invented it everyone has improved on it i was like okay and and even health as your deck and your combat capabilities have been done in none other than Mage Knight itself. So none of the concepts are like, oh my God, a whole thing revolutionary. But when I first read the rules for Undaunted, I went, surely this can't be all. And then I put it on the table and now play the card, activate that unit, roll a die, shoot. And everything makes sense. It both makes sense as a war gamer and it makes sense as a as a for me very light for normal people lightish uh, sensible strategy game so it's not not war game for simulation's sake it's it's a way to appeal to both crowds and and i think david thompson is the best of the 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 war genre across having worked on a few of his other games as past and present uh well then 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 i can say that that it's always been a a thing i noticed about his designs that he can make me feel smart enough while the theme and the war game and the history people will still say well done i'm a, I'm a medium to heavyweight euro gamer that's the the sort of things i work on and the sort of things i i design and develop um and yet a two-player card based war game it just hit 
it just landed with me as to, as to how smart it is and how well it was how well it was put together and how enjoyable it is in that in that two player experience bracket and how well it told uh, how well it told the narrative of mm. the different scenarios like i did feel like i'm fighting an uphill battle with the sniper shooting down from the forest Yeah. And and the reasons I couldn't take out the sniper were a good abstraction of why the real soldiers couldn't take out the sniper too. Obviously, you both designed an expansive solo mode for it. Um, what is your uh, favorite feature of the solo mode that you designed? Undaunted, because of its simplicity, the, the 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 way you play is what is this scenario asking me to figure out? How much can I push that way? How much can I push that way? how much do i have to bolster before i roll out etc and back to my the three questions ago what makes the multiplayer game good if if undaunted was just the first scenario and played over and over again it would be boring what makes undaunted interesting is that you learn one set of rules and then you're presented with a sequence of choices and every individual choice seems simple But when put in context, they're interesting. I mean, I was never a great player at Undaunted, so the behind the scenes peek to everyone, the way the first draft of the solo was designed was I played Anthony here and I took my turn, then he took his turn, then I realized that I made a terrible turn and I asked him <laughs> what I should have done instead. And then what he said, I wrote down and those created the core of the flowchart. So to me, the greatest thing in on the bot is that 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 this succeeded that that we could write the different ways anthony and then digby solves the puzzle of the different scenarios through individually simple choices into the bot yeah, and makes sense. and that's why digby is the lifesaver here because yeah. i'm more of a high level concept and and exciting new things kind of guy so i've quickly designed i think three iterations working on two scenarios and then finally once we got one working i was like okay now i'm stuck and, yeah. And, yeah and that's where i had the story over yeah he definitely came in with the lifeboats when we were out <laughs> yeah. yeah i i built the beautiful ship i got it out to the middle of the ocean i was like okay who's shoveling now <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a lot of hard paddling, but we got there. So yes, David Digby, same question for you. Uh yeah, very similar. I think I think the way that the bot really does replicate those those scenarios and yet remains replayable, I think that's that's the real the real trick. The the core system that David that David built that was built off Anthony's brain. Um but then, then it has just this, names of the US general Anthony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It just it just has those subtleties in it where it kind of you replay the scenario again and you go, Oh, you've gone that way. You don't go over there. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's it it's still using the a same amount of logic and it's still not doing daft things, but it's it's approaching things in a different way. It it will it will send a load of scouts out and it will diversify and you've got no idea where the where the bot's gonna go because all of the objectives are mathematically considered even. And then in a different in playing the scenario again, it will just suddenly zone in on one objective and just channel through that. And suddenly you you need to well do I fight it here and or do I try and run around the outside of it? And it it does replicate the all the subtleties and the you know and the little tweaks in it. And and obviously I'm sure we'll move on to North Africa, but quite how out of control that got at times and how we managed to rein it back in um i think yeah the, the, the other thing on a system level that was very important for me is that anything you can do to throw a wrench in your opponent's play especially in a two-player direct conflict game if you will needs to be a wrench you can throw in the bot you can you can uh, con con conceal yes it's been a while you can conceal the bot you can suppress the bot and that matters mm, the yeah what will play differently if it's been suppressed if it's been concealed than if you don't and yeah. sure you can try to shoot it but if you miss then tough luck so you need to employ all the tools you employ to 
And because your units also matter into its priorities, you can even do feints, like not super complicated ones, but you can move two to the left with one because you know you're going to move three to the right with the other. Uh, what was the biggest challenge that you found creating the solo mode, both for Normandy and particularly for North Africa? <laughs> the, asymm the asymmetry in, in North Africa was, was a massive challenge because Normandy, although the, some of the scenarios are set up differently, and you have the the you know one side might be going for an objective and the other side might be trying to eliminate it's a fairly simple decision pattern with north africa with the the vehicles i mean just the complexity of added well if this unit moves into this seat then suddenly it can do different actions and now it might want to do this on its turn and not that on its turn um and i think you know the, the solution we found for that where if there were two bot units in a vehicle and you kind of just went, all right, well, they'll split the seats. And then yeah. there's a fixed decision tree because although they've got more options, the options don't change. And and it allows you to cope with, with those, you know, myriad of possibilities of having different units in different seats, in different vehicles at different times, in different scenarios, just opened up so much possibility. Um, which is a real strength of the game, but a massive challenge of, of generating the solo and just those, you know, those long days and nights and early mornings of, of playing scenarios again and again and again and again and again to try and find a way of, of recreating the same strength that we had in the, in the Normandy scenarios, which were pretty much done by that point. Yeah, uh, was, I'm, was, I'm not going to say nothing about this because <laughs> you by far bear the brunt of it. The only thing I'm going to add is that when he came back triumphantly, I did it even the last North Africa scenario worked, but all I told him was, yeah, but have you read the mines in reinforcements? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, we should clarify because people might not be aware that uh, the solo mode that we have come up with, um, you can play as either faction in every scenario. So the asymmetry in North Africa was not only a challenge in terms of how does the uh, the bot uh, play for each uh, faction, it's how do they play against the faction that you're playing yourself. So, yeah, and uh, uh, you can also play all of the scenarios available in reinforcements. So you can play them in solo as well, um, which, as you guys uh, mentioned, they were an added challenge as well. David, touch a few questions about Imperium, which is another Osprey release Ooh. coming up for you, uh, co-designed the solo mode for. Well, not just oh, solo, the whole game. Well, the whole game, yeah, yeah. But the solo mode too. Solo mode too. Um, so, uh, my question... A another you... project where I came up with the idea and then made some other pools so poor so proper. <laughs> so it, it seems that that's the pattern how I handle... Because, you know, your games have too many cards in it. And if I have to test every card with every card, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yes, of course, I'll hear me, Nigel Buckle, who is, as we always say amongst ourselves, is the best game designer most of you have never heard of. But I promise 12 months from now, most m most of the our target audience will have heard his name, and Imperium is the first of the triple-ish barrage that Nigel and I are unleashing on the gaming world. So with many more to come from many publishers and uh, nigel is one of the the people that has been you know gaming forever liking games tinkering games and and having unusual not 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 practiced designer repeat rinse type of ideas but why wouldn't i do that yeah and and imperium the biggest selling point of imperium is the asymmetry that you right now we have 16 uh, factions but when i started there was only five and it was already quite noticeable back then that when you play with with the persians or the romans that are both fairly simple fairly middle of the road factions you still play differently and and the, the first thing i did when i joined the project oh my god three four years ago now i can't even remember anymore was to make the market interaction more meaningful more i care where you put your pricing tokens i i can stop you from trashing a card by putting a token on it etc so it's not just a cards that nobody buy get more expensive which is what they are mechanically meant to but they become an interesting thing of why would i put it there so of course we need a solo mode sure but 
if we we absolutely have to make it an asymmetric solo mode because if I'm playing a two-player game as Rome against Persia or a two-player game as Rome against Celts, I'm playing differently, and I should. Which means that if I play Rome solo, I should play differently against the Persia bot than I should play against Celt bot. And second, I came in, I drummed my chest about how games need to be a little bit more interactive than they were when Dominion came out. So we added more interaction to the market, but then I can't not have the bot interact with that. So, uh, and, and we didn't want the flowchart. This is, you know, there's a deck of cards. We don't want extra randomizers. We don't want a war game looking AI for it. Because Undaunted's AI is a little bit war game looking, but it's okay because it's a little bit war game. But yeah. Imperium is, needs to appeal to people who want uh, a different Dominion++ plus plus kind of experience. And those people don't want war game AIs for sure. Yeah. So, so... I, 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 instead of catching the fish, I taught the man to fish, and 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 I showed Nigel how you can simulate this, simulate that, and then he simplified it, and then then I pointed out the problems, then he simplified it again, and then and then we got the system where where Rome could fight back and race you for the fame cards because that's Rome's favorite strategy, and when Rome bought a white card from the market that tends to give it more actions then when the bot flipped that white card it got more actions so it even though the rules were all bypassed and cheated but on the high level it made sense and then i said so nigel what do you want to do about the other back then only eight but quickly escalating the 16 faction yeah, that's like, how we got it right we told, we told them that it'd be eight yeah <laughs> yeah and then he went all right i'll just go and play them a bit and three years later, you see the 16 uh, uh, behavior patterns. Well, actually, it's 32 because, well, almost 32, because uh, in the game, when you become from barbarian to empire, you're op you lose some options, you gain some options, you're, you're easier to generate resources, but you have to spend more, you're easier to be attacked, etc. And the bot does that too. The, yeah. the, the bot switches behavior uh, halfway through the game when it becomes an empire as well. And and the timing that that the Celts switch to Empire much later than the Egyptians. So everything that makes the multiplayer game not just a Dominion with a civilization theme is all in the solo mode too. And Nigel was the hero who then went and played all sixteen bots at least half a dozen to a dozen times each. Some of them with multiple different opponents just to see if there are blind spots. Yeah, then came up with uh, five different difficulty levels and a solo campaign where you can stitch five games <laughs> together or so. I only use flip the top of the deck and resolve the card solo modes if there is like five cards or nine cards in that deck and it reshuffles five times, ten times in a game because then yeah. it's essentially a flattened die. Yeah. But, but I would never shuffle 50 cards together and flip the top one up and do that and done. But, and because of that, and because I work on big heavy games, Mind Clash, Vital Lacerda, you know, the, the, where the sparks fly, I'm used to playing with the levers of how much information can I give so that you can play as well as you can play in multiplayer. And the, the Imperium bot overview that I added to Nigel started with have the bot's hand face up, just you don't know which cards it plays. And, and during development, uh, uh, you and Nigel changed it to the bot hand is face down, but retained the rule that the new cards it gains goes to the top of its draw deck. Therefore, you know it's gonna be in its hand in the next round. And and at first I was like, oh no, you ruined the solo mode. You took out all the information. How will I ever plan what? Wait, no, I don't know what's in your hand in the multiplayer game either. I just plan on what cards you bought, and when did you last reshuffle? And that's exactly the information the solo mode gives you, and that's exactly how you need to plan. So less was more. Uh, thank you uh, both for joining us. I think we covered most of the things that uh, I wanted to cover. So yeah, uh, uh, thanks to everyone for listening as well. Um, both of you, always a pleasure. Good talk. Um, and I look forward to working oh. with you on projects in the future. We'll be um, here. Thank you for watching. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining. <laughs>